and we are very excited for that. I'd like to introduce them to you. Our first panelist is Mr. Mike Deschanel, the president at Silicon Valley Bank. Ultimately, maybe even even better than, than people can. 
But to make this technology really come to the core in, in, in the everyday world, we need to ally it with a bunch of other powerful technologies. So I've been working with David Hansen and friends at Hansen Robotics on putting our open cloud, open source AI technology into the Hansen Robotics humanoid robot, which is the most famous humanoid, isn't it? This is both viable in a bunch of different business niches, and also it's a way for AIs to really get into what it is to be human. You know, they can understand human values, human emotions become part of human human culture. And I can't think of any better way to get constantly human values into AI than to sort of enmesh the AI in constant social interactions with people, and then. In the last year, we started enmeshing our open cloud enhanced robotics technology with blockchain technology as well. And we're, we're in the midst of creating something we call the, the Singularity Net, which is a, it's an online, cloud-based, open platform for decentralized AI. So and we think this can sort of give, give the boost that we need to get from the reasonably intelligent robots and AIs we have now to something with true, true general intelligence. But I, I mean, we want to, we're creating a platform in which anyone who wants to can wrap up AI they've created, put it on the line, wrap it in our APIs and smart contracts, and then their AI can participate in the singularity net open market for AIs. And if the Sophia robot or any other robot or some business's IT system or some embedded device needs AI services, you can then go to this decentralized singularity net and get AI services that could have been contributed from anyone in the world and rating systems and the overall dynamics of the, the network enables that each customer gets the best intelligence they can from this network. So it's, it's both an open market for AIs and it's a cloud-based platform for the emergence of the next level of general intelligence. So one of the great things is if you believe, like a lot of tech optimists, that this thing called artificial general intelligence is going to continue to evolve and evolve at an exponentially faster rate because of more and more technology that then allows it to improve more quickly, which then allows more intelligence and so on. Ben is one of the leading proponents. Importantly, this idea that scarcity, scarcity of food, scarcity of water, scarcity of resource would be problems that could be helpfully addressed through this federation. I mean, that that's why you need a decentralized platform where anyone can contribute to it because if some AI programmer in, for example, Ethiopia, where we have an AI office with 25 programmers doing AI and robotics and all that, I mean, if an AI coder in Ethiopia creates a brilliant machine learning algorithm, right now it's hard for them to monetize that without without pulling together a business team and venture capital. With our framework, those guys could just put their code online and mesh it in the singularity net, then they can monetize that through, through the decentralized open market. And this can help extract the benefits of AI in a way that's much better than charity, because what you're doing is opening it up for anyone in the world to contribute their own brilliance and passion and, and creativity, then profit from that and fully enmesh themselves in the world economy as humans and machines are going to singularity. So, Mike, Ben just talked about great people in Ethiopia and the idea that great ideas and great advances in technology can start from anywhere. As the president of Silicon Valley Bank, your team spends a lot of time around the world looking for amazing people and amazing opportunities to invest. But some of those may not be on the most obvious list, the most obvious radar, Ethiopia, Myanmar, when we think about some of these places. How do you think about ROI as an investor, not always in the context of dollars and cents. Uh, yeah, that's a fun one and a tough one. Uh, I think Ben has some good ideas in terms of decentralizing and maybe spreading it through the rest of the world to others to help. But the reality is good ideas and innovation are always going to be supported by a frictionless environment. So said in other ways, you, know, you have to have the right ingredients in order to develop a company. And the reality is that it does require money to develop good companies. It requires money, it requires people, it requires support from the government, it requires mentors, it requires an environment for failure, and, and sharing of ideas and information. So what Ben does describe, I think that could certainly help out. But 
all having said that, when you look at what's what's transpired in the last few years, we've developed a lot of amazing technology. The cost of doing things have come down radically, right? And so whilst we may be finding these and it's an RRI, the other countries are certainly benefiting in terms of the cost of computing, access to mobile devices, access to the internet. It's continuing to come down and it provides a lot more access to people to build the ideas. Now, I'm encouraged about the future. And it really is about knocking down the barriers in the walls. And I think the internet and technology is a great equalizer. Right? Education is, is fascinating what's happening today. You know, everybody can become an expert instantaneously overnight. And I call you know the YouTube experts. Right? You know, my, my wife was yelling at me recently because I couldn't fix the blinds in our house. Well, what does she do? She gets on YouTube, she figures it out, and now all of a sudden she's the expert in the house on how to fix everything, and I'm worthless. She's partly right. But nonetheless, I think when you start to see that education changing and the pace of change happening so rapidly, I don't think we can comprehend how fast it's changing. So I am encouraged that in the future, you are going to see other countries start to develop some ideas because it's going to be cheaper. You're going to have access to sharing ideas across multiple countries. But again, going back to what Ben is saying, I think that's, that is a real possibility. And the final thing I get excited about is for the first time, you see individuals or kids graduating from university that have been on the internet their entire life. Their ideas, their efficiency on how to change the world and their passion for changing the world is so much greater than, than ours. And I think this generation is better at giving back when we start to see people repatriating back to these countries that have made some money in other areas. They're going to start to give back, and I think you're going to see some real change going forward. One of the people that is working hard to give back, having made some money, uh, Taizo, uh, you built uh, several companies, famously GoGo and, and online gaming, which allowed you uh, a certain level of financial independence, shall we say. Uh, you are now working to enable others to follow their capability and passion and to think about creating impact. You're not focusing on market size, you're not focusing on trend investing. You want to enable people that have an impact. How do you look at this idea of entrepreneurs creating impact, even though sometimes it may not be boiled down to a business plan that you can see? Last 20 years, uh, I've been engaged in the uh, uh, IT industry as an entrepreneur, and uh, uh, very fortunately, I could get some capital gain through the IPOs and so on. And, uh, but this is a real fortune to me. So uh, I strongly felt uh, when I was 40 years old, uh, that uh, I, I, could, I should give back uh, those uh, fortune, fortune to, to the society. So that's why I, I started Misuzo uh, as a latest uh, startup for me um, a couple of years ago. And currently, uh, uh, we have invested 170 million US dollars uh, to startups and so on. Um, not only the, uh, the profitable company, but also uh, even the non-profit uh, we have donated. So, uh, and those uh, money, capital, uh, are all 100% from my individual capital gains. So, I don't have any LP. So, that's why I can, I, I have a free hand to invest and to bet to the future. So, uh, uh, and then I wonder uh, what kind of thing I should do. Because I'm an entrepreneur, so uh, differentiation is very important. So unlike other venture capitals or foundations, uh, uh, I should do something very creative way to invest in a better future. So uh, uh, the Misuzo uh, is, uh, we call ourselves that uh, it's not a venture capital or something like that, but uh, connected impact community. So uh, we are really, uh, we are a member, a uh, bunch of the researchers, entrepreneurs, designers, uh, rock star engineers, and so on, that get together and create a community to, to solve the uh, world's big issues. So um, uh, we are like a kind of a meta entrepreneur that because each entrepreneur starts innovators uh, making great technologies to solve the one certain issue. But uh, in order to uh, solve the big issues in the world, we need to uh, we, we need to make a uh, collective impact. 
So this is my uh, weird uh, kind of coordinator uh, among the innovators, and uh, we create a synergy among the uh, uh, entrepreneurs, innovators, and uh, we will sometimes we will make uh, the same orchestration of project by ourselves to, to involve the great innovators to, to, to make some very exciting projects. So, for example, um, uh, we are talking with the Singaporean government to create a new city from scratch, taking advantage of the new technologies like the autonomous people's drones, AI, and so on. So, um, I, I started sharing this idea with uh, my friend innovators, and everybody said, wow, this is crazy, it's very exciting. So, uh, and if so, uh, we, we might be able to adapt this kind of technology, this idea, this design, and so on. So we start building community first, and then uh, uh, talking with the government people or other potential partners to create some kind of momentum to build something very exciting. So that's our approach, uh, and uh, I'm sure that that kind of project should not uh, can, cannot be described to as uh, to in the business plan or the milestones because we we are in the frontier, so we we have no idea to which way to go. So uh, instead of building a business plan or uh, the, the financial projections and so on, uh, building a community uh, among the very interesting guys and exchange uh, ideas uh, and create some new chemistry among them. And if everyone, all of the members, are so excited, hey, let's build this, uh, let's build like, things like that, and then we will definitely dedicate our energy. Um, so that in that way, uh, we are proceeding. So I want to come back to that in a moment, but William, you're involved in the super hot market of China. Uh, you spend a lot of time, some people think China's important just because it's huge. I tend to be one of those people that thinks it's important because there's some exciting innovation, like invention, that's occurring, especially in areas that include medical technology and artificial intelligence, to name two. Uh, you're spending a lot of time thinking about those issues. Can you help paint a picture a little bit about what you see as China? Not so much trends and issues, but more this perception of China as a place where unbelievable and exciting and world-changing technologies are going to be emerging from. Sure, so China is the number one global first mobile only market. Uh, 800 odd million internet users, and they had to leapfrog. You know, they did not have a you know, business and the internet started about 15, 18 years ago. Uh, and basic services, you could not get them. So the last 15 years, entrepreneurs and, and VCs like me have been investing in companies to solve basic problems. Uh, and most of those problems are now generally solved in China. They're solved pretty well. Uh, but you have a very small number of companies dominating the market. Uh, and the biggest problem we see now is, is user acquisition. Because unless you ally yourselves with one of the big players, uh, no one will ever see your product. Uh, so a lot of companies are relying, instead of on just the, uh, the, 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 in the past, uh, innovating around a process or business model innovation, now they're, they're moving to hardcore tech and technology innovation. It's a lot more like the US, where in order to you know, make an impact, you have to have a, a revolution in tech. Uh, so you're seeing massive amounts of money going into AI, uh, and they're applying it, you know, some to the future, but they're also applying uh, it to better food delivery. Um, they're applying it to insurance. Uh, they're applying it to uh, driving a competitive edge in what's probably the most competitive market in the world. And I'd say the second trend uh, where you see innovation coming out of China is Chinese bringing that innovation outside. So in Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, South America, you're increasingly seeing Chinese business models used, and those models are disrupting local markets. 
Uh, for example, instead of selling phones, you know, you give the phone away for very little money or even for free, and you make money on the services. And that's disrupting a lot of markets. You're seeing, especially in Southeast Asia, where trains companies are not coming in directly, uh, but they're making, taking major stakes uh, in the leading payment company, in the leading e-commerce company, uh, and using those as, as footholds uh, to roll out the same playbook that they, they did in China. So there's two types of innovation again. It's not just hardcore tech, uh, but it's also business model. Uh, and the hardcore tech is really taking off now in China. The business model uh, innovation is now spreading globally. So here's what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna look out to the audience. So you have, from my far side here, you've got Mike, who's president of Silicon Valley Bank, well-traveled global leader. You've got William, who spends time thinking about investing in and building businesses in China, from China. You've got Taizo, who built and sold several companies and invests in lots of cool impact. And Ben, that's working on globalization, federation, democratization of artificial intelligence in addition to his number of other interests. So it's a pretty unique opportunity. I'm gonna to go to you and see if there's questions that anybody has that uh, we can bring forward because I don't wanna to ask too many of my own. So can I ask just for anybody has a question, bold enough, brave enough to raise hand? I know this is always the tricky bit when we all sit here and look quietly at a group of people. Any questions that we can get? I knew Piyush that you would ask a question. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, you know, the, the conference is founding a new world, and my question is actually to Daigo san and to Ben. Uh, I'm not sure, but I guess you have uh, read um, Harari's uh, book on Homo Deus. Uh, but to paraphrase, uh, one of the challenges I think we face as we go into the world, particularly singularity and AGI, etc., uh, he, he, he transfers it to three things. One, he calls the creation of the useless class, which Mike is not different from your feeling worthless. Uh, in that case, your wife made you do it, but increasingly computers can make you worthless. The second is the idea that this singularity net at the top controls everything that mankind and humanity does, in which case, what is the role of the individual in the equation? And of course, the third, which is the most scary, the creation of a super species, maybe some cyborgs with some uh, so we are with AI printed sitting in a little bunker in New Zealand and a few hundred, a few handful of hundred thousand people controlling the world and the rest of the world is really not relevant. How do we actually think about the societal impact we started with Steve, the social science agenda to mirror the advances in technology so we can shape that new world order we really need? Okay, so if I think about it or to, we, we chatted about this the other day at lunch, this idea that as automation, intelligence can do more and more, do many, many jobs become useless and, and creating a super-sized category of useless class. And then, Ben, you've talked about the idea that there's problems eliminated. There's the other side of the coin which says different types of problems. Yeah, I mean, create. to say you're useless if you no longer have to do work to get basic resources to live, <clears throat> doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I think that in the next few decades, AIs and robots and machinery, my personal view is they will eliminate essentially all human jobs in the sense that they will eliminate need for humans to do work to get resources, but then humans can pursue intellectual, spiritual, artistic, uh, and social pursuits. I mean, there, there's a lot of things to do to carry out tasks to accumulate resources for your survival. So I think that that's not the deepest issue. I mean, the, the more interesting issue is when you have artificial general intelligences that are twice, ten times, a hundred, a thousand times more capable than humans and that can revise their own minds at, at, at will based on, on their own desires, I mean, what, assuming, let's assume these are benevolent to us, which I think we can do by raising the AIs with, 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 with love and kindness. So as they get smarter and smarter, they will reciprocate that love and kindness back to us. Suppose we succeed in that, then what do you choose as a human? Do you choose to sort of merge your mind in with the loving, benevolent, 
super intelligent mind matrix, or do you choose to remain human? Because that's, you know, there's a certain aesthetic and value to being human, even though there are these other options out there that, that are, are possible. And I think different people will make, will make different choices. But that, that's really the future as we're trying to build it, where AIs, they can do all the jobs, they're much smarter than people. If you want to remain human, you can be provided for it. You can, you can paint, you can play sports, you can hang out with your friends, you can prove math theorems, or you can merge your brain into the super intelligent mind matrix. You may lose yourself, but you will gain new things that as a human you cannot even imagine. So there's this idea that says we're all moving closer and closer to technology anyway, and the fact that we're all dependent on smartphones, whereas 10 years ago that would have been a different thought. And so there's a video where Ben basically sort of keeps tapping a phone against his head, saying, you know, all I'm going to do now is disintermediate this this device. <laughs> <You're running laughs> there, there you go. So, <laughs> so the idea that you basically just take one more step and go from something in a device to something embedded. So Taizo, you've talked about building a community, essentially a self-organizing community that thinks about what it wants to prioritize and value. So picking up on Piyush's point, do entire social structures change in the future from something sort of central and in control to something self-organizing? Yeah, um, in my opinion, uh, the, if the, the AI uh, sees more and develop more, and, uh, and then uh, the so society will become more productive and more efficient. So we don't have to struggle for uh, the, the uh, meaningless work, jobs, and so on. So, uh, uh, and then I think uh, the society will become more decentralized. Uh, we, uh, and uh, uh, the, the, each community will become smaller. Uh, you know, uh, urbanization is now coming in. Uh, so if we look at the all over the world, uh, the people are losing jobs and they are getting together in the city and the uh, urban area is becoming very crowded. Uh, and, but uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, it's, it's just a temporary uh, situation, uh, in my opinion. And uh, if uh, the technology uh, will be well developed, uh, and then uh, we, we can we can decentralize. We can we can live in the countryside, but there's no uh, disadvantage to living in the countryside uh, compared to the urban side. Uh, so we they, uh, people will spread uh, geographically and moving around uh, depends on the life cycle. So and then uh, we can feel more happier to uh, of the uh, better than the best of the quality of the land. Uh, so that kind of future I like to make with uh, the other family members, uh, with our friends, to build a community to solve, uh, to make up. Because um, the, the well-known researcher called Alan Kay, they, he said that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So instead of the predicting the bad future, uh, we should invent the good future. I, I think, uh, <laughs> just to, to quote a uh, Benism, uh, there's a lot of attention on making chocolate chocolatier, <laughs> more, more chocolatey, versus an important amount of resource going into improving how we can think of healthcare and how we can think of public safety and so on in, in new ways. Uh, is there another question since Piyush kindly broke the ice for the first question, which may be the tricky one? Anybody else want to muster the courage to ask a question before I move on? No oh, one in the back. Uh, back, right? Yeah, sorry, it's hard to see when there's lights here. Or there. Is, was there something in, in the back? Yes, it is it's in the back, right? Okay. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Taka. I'm doing venture capital. And so basically, I'm on the foresight to this technology is moving or build, driving our society into the next step. But at the same time, like my grandpa, grandma, was like ordinary people, which is 
not in here is feeling kind of scary about that, maybe. And even though like technology is developed and some maybe like uh, whether it's centralized or decentralized, and like money is accessible by like crowdfunding or whatever you call. But how eventually like ordinary people or even my ne next generation or student here will adapt or will be educated based on that kind of uh, just three different technology movements. And, and also I like that to see that what the role of the of government in that living in that that society. Could take a first shot for you. Sure, no, no, go. So I think, uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're uh, pretty good at can, can you just also paraphrase for those that may uh, Yeah. Uh, so how is this technology going to help ordinary, regular people? Um, how is education going to change? And then I think the other question for you about uh, Singapore's role, right? So, Thank you. But I also think it's about the older generation as well, too, that's being radically impacted by this. How are we going to handle that, or how the government's going to handle it, or our parents, so to speak? Yeah, so, as investors, we invest in solving companies that solve problems. Um, so, we're using machine learning uh, areas like uh, credit, credit scores and financial services. So, in Southeast Asia, you've got 530 million credit scores, but a couple billion people. And people can't get basic financing, they can't get credit. Um, so if, they, if uh, they can only can rely on their friends and family, and if a storm wipes out an area, uh, they're basically stuck. Uh, so one use of data uh, is to provide credit and a credit score uh, to people. So that's a benefit of centralized data. Uh, we also have uh, companies that uh, are using uh, chatbots and machine learning compared with uh, actual teachers. Uh, to give one-on-one -on -one language learning lessons uh, to multiple people at the same time. So one teacher can actually teach one-on-one, -on -one, personally, over 200 students at the same time. Uh, so the teacher can make a living. The students can also now afford uh, to have a one-on-one -on -one teacher uh, that has a uh, sort of a chatbot assistant. Um, so there's a lot of ways that people's lives are, are getting better. Um, but I think it's, it's a key point here when you talk about centralization versus decentralization. We've seen a massive centralization uh, power in a very few uh, companies. Uh, there's a little bit of a backlash now. Uh, but what we're looking for technology to do is hopefully decentralize things again. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, we're basically going to be living in a 1984 type of situation where it might not be AI, but a very few uh, number of players uh, will have uh, a lot of control. So when I, when I think about the role of government, I don't look at government as the answer by any stretch, having spent the vast majority of my career more in private sector trying to build up companies. but. I do appreciate more, having spent the last four and a half, five years working with Singapore government, that enabling things, education, let's pick the example. I'm a huge fan of personalization. The one-to-one -one of medicine, the one-to-one -one of education. So knowing what's important and how that particular child understands and processes, is it auditory, is it visual, how do they learn? I think that's going to be amazing, and I think government has the ability to move those things in terms of an education paradigm or an education framework. It doesn't mean that they build it or do it, but it's hard for education at a national level to occur if government isn't a supportive player. So I look at government as helping smooth and enable, not do, so that would be my perspective on, on government. I think commitment to ongoing research funding, commitment to ongoing education funding are two critical roles for government, and I think that's why some governments around the world with this sort of wildly varying levels of commitment that's not predictable is, is not a positive. A lot of great things came out of important innovations in the U.S. in the 40s and 50s that wouldn't be possible today based on the uncertainty of funding. Mike, you live in the place that's seen by most around the world as the sort of pinnacle of innovation and creativity in terms of Silicon Valley. The government has played an important role way back when, when the U.S. military was buying everything that Fairchild and Intel could produce to put them on nose cones, uh, DARPA and so on. What do you think when you take a look 
would be the right way to think of government, just with a sort of capital G, and everybody else. Is, is there a, the right mix? Is there an optimum balance? Yeah, it's one of those things you need to be careful of what you wish for with governments, uh, particularly in the United States and, and these days as well. But nonetheless, I mean, government does and can play a role, particularly in the emerging economies or developing economies as well, too. I think in the United States, they can sometimes tend to get in the way, as we see that as well, whether they created a tax-conducive economy or whether they're investing in startups or enabling startups to start, right? So again, the whole, the whole idea is to create a frictionless society, so making it easier for ideas to come to fruition. And again, if a government is bought in, like what you guys have here in Singapore, then I think you, you have a chance for success. From 2002 to 2011, I lived in Washington, D.C., and I was primarily doing AI consulting work for U.S. government agencies in various states. And that's the time when I really created the core artificial thinking of it. I was at Open Frog and the Fancy Robots Mind, and then the Sigma Argument. And then, you know, now that AI and robotics have become and we're involved in some of the real world, we've got to look at the world of the great stuff and the noise. We're not going to talk about that thing in the But in the time when industry didn't really see the promise of AI, it was the US government and European and Japanese other governments that allowed AI technology to incubate for a long period of decades. So there, there has been a couple of different things. This is one of those tricky things where you think about data protection. Some people think that general intelligence or artificial general intelligence will be more difficult now in Europe because of some of the privacy and data laws, which means using large amounts of data is going to be more difficult than it may have been before. Uh, one more question. Yes, please. I'll come back in a little bit. Can you guys hear me? My question is, we have seen so many innovative companies around, but there are also maybe traditional companies. So what's the best way to build the biggest push that comes with the company? Okay, yeah. Well, you have so, an answer. Is there, a, is there a one, two, three on how traditional companies and those new companies are working? Sure. So um, we're running innovation, open innovation programs for 22 multinationals. Uh, and also some family companies, so traditional family companies in Southeast Asia. Uh, and I think the, uh, the issue is that generally the goals of the multinationals and the goals of the startup are very, very far apart. Uh, and they also speak to generally some different languages. So there's a communication issue. And then there's a time problem, because the startup doesn't have very much time. And the traditional company is a multinational and the family company, they take a lot of time. So what we've done um, is we've worked with uh, a lot of large companies to help identify specific uh, things that they can work on when they have a challenge or a goal or an opportunity. Uh, and then we make them put money up front because a lot of these big companies do not respect something they didn't have to pay for. Um, we find startups and we match uh, to them uh, based on an existing platform product or service where that startup will work with on something very, very specific. Uh, and then we roll it out, we roll it out live. Uh, and so over the last two and a half years, that's actually worked well for companies like uh, Johnson & Johnson, uh, we were partnering with Nestle, we in the Visa. Um, it's, uh, it's very, very specific and goal-oriented, that's the way to do it. Mike, you've got something. Yeah, I, you know, I think you know, traditional companies are under fire, without a doubt. We, we know that we've seen industries being disrupted So you know, we kind of have a saying, it's, it's not a question of if you're going to get disrupted, it's a question of when. So you better disrupt yourself before somebody else does. And that's kind of the big problem that traditional companies have. 
you're not disrupting themselves today, right now, they're going to be out of business in, in 10 days. Yeah, so that's our goal here. I mean, just leave sure the first hardware accelerator, and we're disrupting hardware companies. Then we went into biotech, and we're disrupting uh, big pharma and health. And the last one we're going into is food tech and ad tech, starting two and a half years ago. And we're going to, to disrupt that industry and say, where it's only six companies in the world that control that market, but it's opening up to become more decentralized. And so there's a really interesting interplay because the more effective and the more powerful and the more miniaturized and the more low cost that hardware becomes, it drives efficient advances and this is the exponentiality. So there's more things that then feed the work that Ben is doing and API. So it's an elegant interconnect. But the simple way that I think of these things, having spent a lot of time in corporates and some time in government and some time in startups, companies are good at executing. You have a plan, you execute the plan, and every 90 days is how things start and finish as a general state. And startups are good at experimenting. And big companies are less good at experimenting. So it's, it's hard to bring those two different things together. In terms of where we want to bring this thing all home, we're down, down to the last minute or two. What I'd like to do is just do the traditional go around and say, what are the things that you take a look at the next two, three, five, ten years. What's on your mind when you take a look at the next two, three, five, ten years in terms of tech and human attitudes? You know, I think Ben summed it up pretty nicely. I think the artificial intelligence, I mean, the prospect of uh, somebody replacing me in my job or I'm for 10% a day is quite attractive. And clearly brings a lot of social implications as well, which we definitely have to figure that out and we all need to come together. But really, I think I get really excited about the future of the technology of those companies. When you look at the case of today, it's the slowest it will ever be. So, um, we're really focused on uh, to the last four billion. Uh, so, we've got the like, US, Western Europe, we the first billion in Europe, the third billion, we've got China. Uh, if you look at just India alone, it'll be 500 billion in the next few years, in the next few years, in the next couple of years. And they're all going to be the first billion in the world, and we're going to have a little bit of an annual salary. This is a huge work, and it's also a huge challenge. How are we going to feed everybody? How are we going to educate everybody? Uh, how are we going to let them become the uh, uh, greatest up of their, their general standard of living? I think technology has to play a massive role there. And that's where we're investing a lot of money and uh, our time. A couple of years ago, uh, I made up my mind that I will dedicate my rest of my life uh, to accelerate innovations and um, and uh, ultimately, uh, innovation is made uh, by connecting different dots. Uh, so uh, I like to be the bridge among the different dots. For example, I was born in Japan, and uh, until last year I was moved everywhere, and I just moved here this year. So uh, I like to be the bridge, for example, among the Singapore and but, um, and also, ultimately, uh, the education is the great solution to create the innovations. So, uh, especially for me personally, uh, I'm very passionate to updating the uh, uh, kids' education. So, uh, and if you look at the education history, uh, in the 19th century, uh, the Robert Owen, uh, George Scott, Robert Owen, or the Plato, Freddie uh, uh, has uh, invented the notion of the definition of the kindergartens. And so at the time, uh, the kids are regarded as a small adult, to small layer of a uh, factory layer. So uh, they uh, thought that the, the kids should be uh, educated uh, in kindergarten uh, so that they can uh, foster nurture. Then, uh, as a man, or entity as a man. But from the other hand, if you look at today's education system, uh, the kids' uh, uh, educational environment is too discriminated, discriminated from the society. So that's why I should be I, I felt that we should be the 
the society and you know, the kids, the, the education and that. So I, I'm going to start uh, the new activities about the updating and kids' education system. Thanks, sir. I come to look at the next few decades, not just from the view of the particular technology projects I'm working on, but trying to build a cloud based thinking machine that has office, but more in that you can look at various different AI technologies, robotics technologies, blockchain, many other technologies. Brain computer interfacing, which is not a good thing to get into that much. All these things, they're working to turn you know, the surface of the planet into what's we call the kind of global brain. We have human minds, you have our, our embedded devices, and the devices that will be embedded in us. Then you have AI models, and communication models. This is the first of global intelligence, AI capability. So here's what we do know, is that if you take a look at the internet and you say, wow, if you take a look back at 93, 92, 93, and you see where it is today, those that are not sure whether a global brain is possible, I think we can all agree that tech continues to accelerate, exponentially changing and creating new opportunities that are difficult for us to understand, but exciting nonetheless. We never want to lose track of the social side of it, so that's really important. Ben and Sophia, the humanoid robot, will be back here at 12.40 or 12.45 here on this stage talking about some of these things, which was pretty cool. I hope you missed that. So what I'd like to do is to say, you've heard from leaders around the stage with different experiences and different influences. Thanks for being a part of the conversation. Thanks, guys, for being a part of it. Let's keep the conversation going off stage and over the next couple of days. Thanks again. Thank you so much to the four amazing panelists. Really appreciate that. We actually have some tokens of appreciation for our panelists. So, Steve, if I could ask you to pass this along to your amazing friends who are so grateful to have had here on board with us. We decided to get them something, so if you don't mind giving each one of them that, just as a thank you for your time, we really appreciate that and your insight. Thank you, hopefully you'll have some fun over here.